I freeze frame passion, which is a larceny of grand proportions, a distortion of reality, reportioning names and events to fit an eventuality of my choosing. A finality I will justify in the microcosms of a moment, and I will own it, echoing in the eternity of an instant, because we are all but eye blinks in the face of infinity and gods, only in our thoughts. Frame one. I burn my tongue spitting acid. Taste buds singe like matchstick ends, sermonizing their swan song of sensation with each slash across the ridges of my mouth's ribbed interior, plasticizing peace from pinpricks of pain, but I cannot refrain. I speak sanctimonious at times that others a freak, blasting away a million miles a minute with no regard for speed limits and sound barriers. My lips oscillate with each passing thought. Chapped in blister, they bleed dried skin, straining my words, barely retaining cohesion like released lesions of barbarian hordes, teeming masses swarming forward, clamoring for your life. Frame two. I lunge, as if escaping purgatory, yearning for the sweet bliss of heaven and the blessings of Christ Almighty. But what I'm reaching for is, in fact, a ball, bleached from years of youths in sun-drenched fields and backyards, alleyways and driveways, shaved smooth from thousands of hands, grabbing, catching, punching, years of skidding and pounding it, careens out of bounds, and I'm after it, wrenching my arm back in an effort to send it flying in the opposite direction, saving a game that nobody wants me to win, and I know that I will probably lose. I strike just as my chest and forearms hit gnarled asphalt, tearing skin mercilessly like tissue paper, rocks and glass, scraping my fleshy undersides, blood kicked by dirt. I strike knowing that I play for pittance, for the glory of an afternoon, for the admiration of pre-adolescents playing on pavement between six lines of chalk marking four squares, an arena having the same momentous occasion as the Colosseum, but only in the eyes of children and only in the mind of this 12-year-old boy. Frame three. I breathe. Exhalations paced by strides. Rejecting requests the best heart valves and lungs for greater airflow. Spare me no digging my throat shudders with each passing gasp. <laughs> Spare me no digging with each passing gas. Tendons stretched and muscles aimed at Herculean exertions. I meditate on the mantra, there is no spoon, there is no spoon, there is no spoon. I ruminate on the thought that Sisyphus did not suffer because he himself said so, simplifying his situation by saying it is all a state of mind. Sweat leaks from my pores as if I were a washcloth being wrung out, fibers twisted and pulled. My wool frays, but does not tear. I go limp, legs languid like a stitched doll, barely bound by worn strands of a thin thread, but I ragged Annie along, puppeteered by unsung strings. A sonambulant sojourn that is borderline suicidal. Frame four. I feel the grain of paper beneath calloused fingertips, dimples in thickly pressed sheets that blush as my right hand brushes against them while my left flits across my visual spectrum, mapping out landscape before me, acting as cartographer of my immediate universe. The two work in tandem, talking in tactile terms, speaking in visual soliloquies. Pencil pinched between opposing digits, my right hand cuts canvas, etching out intersections and waypoints, fast twitch muscles reacting to nerve clusters, corresponding with every change in my perception. Pupils dilate, switching from macro to micro, scanning borders, piercing framework, discerning wonders of a world seen but never recorded as I shed myself of the sins of repetition and symbolism. The work expands and contracts. Useless fluff falls away in shavings of gum and graphite. Ghosts of images past call it only become wisps of nothing, drowned out by the reverberations of lines of ink and charcoal that cut like barbed wire, yet hum like cello chords. And I laugh to myself as errant scratches congeal to forms recognizable because for some reason they call it a still life. Frame five. Oh. Frame five. <laughs> I lead. Intimate ranges of 10 total seconds, she follows for reasons that pass for understanding, allowing my hand to hold hers, perhaps because he had turned her down, mistaking her overtures as charity, pride pushing him back into his folding chair, regret loves a folding chair. Not wanting to waste a window, I turn to her on the dance floor to find dimples and teeth which say, okay, I'm here, but I catch a glimpse of satin eyebrows which ask, do you know what you're doing? A valid question I dare not answer as my plan ended on the faux hardwood we were standing on. Trying not to betray my discombobulation, I start to sway to the music, silently praying to whatever deity occupied the lower half of my body, invoking my Latin bloodlines, hoping I'm not crossing lines. I tell myself not to think of the night of inebriated girls who didn't understand the concepts of personal space or oral hygiene, to dismiss the incident involving the attempted windmill and the fallout thereafter, but most importantly, I direct myself to fail to recollect my previous partner, specifically how she fit flush between myself and the melody. Fingers and palms like tumblers, her grooves aligning them perfectly and with a twist, unlocking my yoke of repression and hesitation. I tell myself not to think of the late nights, the early mornings, the long conversations punctuated by tears and laughter. To remember not to remember the way she felt in my arms. Sweaty and tired, but enlivened by the frailty of the moment, not wishing to miss an instant, an instrument on herself. I swear at times the music played her. But before I recall to revoke my evocation of past participation, I became aware of a broader indication. You see, the song had changed. Reflected in the widened eyes before me was joy. A Pavlovian response triggered by a bass line ringing in the sweet spot of her cerebral cortex, massaging her amygdala, shotgunning signals down her spine to a waistline winning in and out. In conjunction with toes tapping in Morse code, she had found her gateway drug, imbibing with impunity, moving as a celestial body governed by rules predating my misapprehension. I am caught inexorably in her orbit. Slipping down her gravity well, pulled past this event's horizon, and I laughed because there's only one thing left for me to do. I let go of a life raft of a memory, and I allow myself to fall. I blink. 
Bidding farewell to the banalities currently binding me to the present, birthing new breeds of bombastic absurdity, fervently repurposing people and personalities into a burgeoning body of insanity. My vanity is that I freeze frame passion, but only for a moment. Because passion viewed in retrospect, not held in check, becomes an epitaph, consuming a dimming future whose promise is buried beneath the catalog of more worthier deeds. Until my time has come, I will don my past like a second skin to be shed seasonally, remnants of which can be read in my cheeks and eyelids like braille, but never so constrictive as to leave others gasping for air. And on occasion, I will pay homage to friends fallen and fortunate ends, but not because what was burns brighter than what is, but because what can be still burns to this day and will continue to light my way, provided I have the courage to dance, to speak, to create, to be, to do those things that I just talked about. Thank you. Wow.